Strengthen our leadership, God. Strengthen our pastor on today, God. Touch him, God. Touch him in a new way, God. We just give him revelation, God. Have him draw closer to you, God. Have him hear a word from you on him today, God. And give him the boldness to speak that word, God, in the name of Jesus. Give him the boldness to speak what you want him to speak, God. Protect him and his family, God, in the name of Jesus. And we just thank you, God. We thank you for what you've done in his life, God. We thank you for the favor you've shown. We thank you for the favor that's coming more, God. We thank you as he moves forward, God, that you're with him, God. And we just thank you, God. We thank you for how you're touching every single person, God. And we just ask you, God, that you just continue to touch us, God. And let us continue to receive from you, God, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, God. Bless everybody who had a mind to come. Bless those who are on the way, God. And we just thank you, God. Thank you for the new people that are coming, God. Thank you for the souls that will be touched by you, God. And thank you, God. Just thank you, thank you, thank you, God. We praise your name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We praise your name, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because you delivered us, God. You delivered us from darkness, God. You brought us into the light, God. And we thank you, God. We thank you for the light, God. In the name of Jesus, we pray, God. Pray, God, and thank you, God, in the name of Jesus. Amen.
portion of our church is that almost the absolute majority. Amen. <laughs> amen. Keep them in prayer. And also, um, we just honor the Lord. Amen. For our first time guests, we thank y'all so much for you. We are honored that in all the places that you could be today, you are here with us. And we thank God. We don't believe that anything happened by accident, happenstance, or coincidence. But we appreciate the divine providence of God. And we use this place. We thank God so much um, for you. Um, we thank God for our sister Angelica here this morning. Yeah. She had vacation last week. Yeah. Amen. And I thank God that he enabled her to have some time away and to come back and to um, be able to travel back safely. And I praise God for all of us that God continues to bless and go up and down um, those dangerous highways. Amen. I want to direct your attention today to the book of Luke. We're looking at chapter 15. Luke chapter 15, beginning at verse 11. Luke chapter 15, beginning at verse 11. Luke 15, 11. As you're finding it, we're praying, Father, I thank you. You're a great God. You're a mighty Savior. You're a deliverer. You're kind to us. You're wonderful. And Lord, we thank you that you have given us space and opportunity once again just to tell you thank you and to express our appreciation to you for all that you have done. Lord, we don't just want our praise to be with words, but we want our lives, oh God, to reflect the gratitude and the thankfulness that we have towards you. So, Father, we pray that in these moments, you will speak to us, speak, God, not merely superficially, but God, speak to the core of who we are. Speak deeply into us, God, that there might be transformation and change. We don't want to leave this place the same way that we came, but Lord, we want to get to know you better. We want our faith in you to be stronger. We want God a stronger resolve. And Lord, whatever is missing, whatever is broken, we pray, God, that you're filling the missing pieces. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. God bless you again in Jesus' name. In the book of Luke chapter 15, beginning at verse 11, it says, And he said, and this is Jesus speaking, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living, or he split up the inheritance amongst the two sons. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want and began to suffer need. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave them to him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. And am no more worthy to be called thy son, make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him, and had compassion, and ran, and fell on his neck, and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe, and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet. And bring hither the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Let's pray and speaking to the Lord um, throughout the course of this week. And the Lord spoke to me a number of things, but two words stood out. He uttered these words, total surrender. Let me say to a neighbor that might be a little bit far from you today, but say total surrender. Total surrender is what God is expectation of us um, from us. And, 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 I, and those two words are quite intimidating, and they're even worse when you mix them both together. The first is total, that deals with entirety. It means the, the absolute sum. It means leaving out nothing. It's sort of like if I say to you, um, give me the total of everything that's in your wallet. I mean, don't leave anything left behind. And we struggle with totality because we ask ourselves, what's left for me if I give you total, total, total entirety? And I did want to stop and to pause and to give some consideration to that 
because the, the, the opposite or the opposite of total is part. And I think that's difficult for us conceptually because we think that the opposite of total is a little bit. But the opposite of total is not a little bit, it's a part. And so we come to God and we say, God, look at all this I've given to you. Look at all of this as if that is sufficient. It's like, no, but no, that's the opposite of what I asked for. Because whether it's a little bit or a lot, it's still only a part and it's still not the total amount. Does that make sense to anybody? Because I think that we live in the day and time where we sometimes struggle with the metrics around this and we forget the fact that God does not simply want a lot of us. He wants all of us. And sometimes we are challenged because we look at the sum, we look at the sums that we have gathered and we look at how much and we're and we're quite proud of ourselves sometimes. Look at all this. And you know that that story comes to mind where there was that rich young ruler in Matthew chapter 19 where he's like, good master, what good thing can I do that I might have everlasting life or eternal life? He says, why call it down me good? But if we skip ahead towards the conclusion, we'll find that Jesus will tell him to sell all that you have and give to the poor. And what intimidated him or what frightened him was not that he had to give some, it was that Jesus was requiring of him all. And I think that sometimes we do people a disservice when we talk about discipleship in any terms that do not include totality, that do not include all, that do not include whole, because Jesus wants all of us. Well, what part of me does he want? Does he want the spiritual part? He wants all of you. What aspect of me? All of you, whether it be emotions, whether it be your mind, whether it be your body, all of it belongs to him and he is worthy of all of us. Again, that the concept is total surrender. And then that second word, surrender, causes us difficulty because surrender is all about control. It is all about who gets the final say, about who gets to say what, what happens and when. Not only what happens and when, but also how. And so as we're looking at this text, and oftentimes we begin talking about what we call the prodigal son within the context of lost things, the lost coin, for example, the lost sheep, and now the lost son. But if you go back a few pages before that, perhaps, in your Bible, in Luke chapter 13, you'll find that there's a whole lot of talk that Jesus is making with respect to repentance and with respect to preparation for the kingdom. And could it be that part of what he's trying to share with us is this understanding and this notion of what it means to truly repent and to truly turn to him and to truly give ourselves over to him. Now, I, I don't know. This story is a struggle for me because... It has a happy ending, but the process is difficult. It's a difficult process because I think that many of us would prefer simply to have had the young man stay at the house, do all of the right things, live happily ever after without any of this dramatic stuff that happens in between. The demanding of the inheritance, the leaving the house, the going there, and then all of a sudden a famine coming, difficulty coming, him being down to nothing, and then here he comes back to the father's house. We struggle with that. And um, for many of us, I think that when we interpret the story, we sometimes interpret it with the lens that either this man's flesh or the devil has prompted this horrible journey that brings him from, from, from prosperity down to nothing. And then the longer I live, Brother Ben, even more, I begin to understand that total surrender seems to be less about our will and willpower. And sometimes it is about God orchestrating circumstances that lead us to the place of total surrender. That makes sense to him. That it is very possible and very easy for us early in our Christian journeys to say, yes, Lord, I give you everything. And then only a couple days later, find there's some things that we don't necessarily want to give to the Lord. And so we hold back on those things, but we have swallowed our, confidence, our, our consciences 
by giving note to all the many things, though, that we have been doing. And certainly, God must be pleased with that, and this is wonderful and great, and both of us can be happy. I can be happy. God can be happy. I get the little bit I want. God gets the whole lot that he wants. But therein is our error that he does not simply just want a whole lot. He wants everything. And it seems to us that we begin to discover that if we're going to serve God, we don't get the luxury of serving God in our own terms or by our own terms. We've got to serve God the way that he wants us to serve him. We've got to do it his way. Or in essence, we do it no way at all. Many of you remember the story, and I won't bore you by rehearsing all the detail, but you do know there were two brothers, one who was named Cain, one who was named Abel. And what we discover very quickly from the biblical narrative is that it is not enough to bring a sacrifice, but the sacrifice must meet God's conditions. It must meet God's conditions. God has specifications. God has design. Even when the law of Moses comes, you'll find there are specifications and designs that go along with the, the, the sacrifice, the condition of the sacrifice, and the conditions under which this to be offered, who it is that's supposed to offer the sacrifice. In other words, God has a way that he wants things to be done, and we do not get to shift around God's ways to do things our way and then convince God to be happy with what we have done. But we've got to always do it. His way. Could it be that this young man's journey is necessary in order to bring him to a place? I'm not talking about a physical location because you recognize that he ends up in the same location from where he started. So this is not about physical location, but perhaps it was designed to bring him to a place within himself that he had never been even when he was home. Sometimes you've got to leave the home location go for a little journey and come back to recognize, to finally recognize, to finally get to where you were supposed to be the whole time. And if you struggle with me telling you the fact that you can be lost at home, read a couple more verses beyond what I did, and you'll find that there's an older brother who was in the home that watched the younger brother leave, and you'll find out that even though that older brother never left, he truly wasn't at home either. Understand what I'm telling you. That is so important for us to recognize that sometimes God uses circumstances and situations in order to get our attention and to get us to sincerely, sincerely bring our hearts towards him. I think that there was a challenge of when the, the, the younger brother first left. I, I don't think that his, his, his journey created that. I think that's who he always was. I think that the younger son, when he, when, when, when he thought of his father, the value of the father's house to him was the inheritance. It was the stuff. And if you don't believe that, just look at the next funeral that you go to. And oftentimes we know that there's a whole lot of drama that surrounds what's being left and who's getting it and who's getting that. And people that were never even around suddenly feel entitled to everything that's in the house. The young man looked, and I, I think that even though his father is alive, it seems almost as if he's counting down the days to his father's transition so that he can get the stuff that he knows is coming to him. And how insulting it is to ask his father, who is still alive, for his inheritance now. Had I been that young man's father, the story might have been a little bit different. But then we wouldn't have this wonderful story to tell today. We're not here to talk about me, though. We're talking about the father in this story who did not write his son out of the will. <laughs> and, 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 and so this young man, he, the value that he sees is in the stuff. And then he finally gets all the stuff that he wanted. And, and for some of us, that's what our life journey has afforded us. The opportunity, sometimes God allows you not to just squander in misery. Sometimes God lets you get all the stuff that you thought you wanted. He finally gets all the stuff that he thought he wanted. He says to the father, give me the portion of inheritance that falls to me. And his father says, fine, 
Here, take it. And he gets it. He actually gets it. He actually gets it. And I want you to fall into understanding and consider that. The next time that you consider the things that sometimes we're inclined to want in life. He actually got it. And the process, you'll find as we have read this story, that even though he got everything that he wanted, he still was not happy. Because the stuff that he wanted did not bring him the satisfaction that he thought that it would. And there are a whole lot of people in, our, in, our, in the world today who are looking, if only I could get this, if only I could get that, and perhaps right now, they've not gotten all the stuff that they wanted, but in their minds, they believe, if only I could, if only the Father would give me everything that, 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 that falls to me, I will be happy. And the testimony of this story is that that stuff will not make you happy. It's, a, it's an amazing commentary on human existence. That perhaps we don't know as much as we think we know. And that we don't even know what really makes us happy. We don't even know what really makes us satisfied. We oftentimes deceive ourselves into thinking that the various things that we enumerate on our Santa Claus list will provide some measure of long-term satisfaction to our souls, only to become, become frustrated when it doesn't. And so look again at this story of this young man who now gets everything that he has asked for, and now he feels that he is positioned to leave his father's house and to begin to have a wonderful and great life. Now, I, I do want to add this caveat to my own young people that live in my house. I'm not discouraging you from moving out when the time is right. Just want to make sure that you know that. You know, y'all should move out. I will not be mad. But the intention of this story is the motive of the young man who is now moving out. And he thinks that, I mean, this guy is set. Let's be honest here. This guy is now set financially. In fact, he has left his house with probably much more than my own children will leave our house with. I mean, he is doing, doing very, very well. But financial affluence with spiritual bankruptcy will always lead to demise and ruin. The absence of character cannot be made up for with money. There's not enough money to save you if your character is bereft or if your character is deficient. Does this make sense to anybody? He has dishonored his father's house. He has left, and it seems like everything should be right for him in the world, and it absolutely is not. He has exercised his will. He has exercised what seems to be his choice and his decision. And yet life has not turned out the way that he would have planned it. How do things go wrong when you get what you want? How in the world is that even possible? I shared with you that our, our, our focus topic, total surrender. And so he, he, he gets out. He goes to a far country. We don't want to be close by. He's going to establish a name for himself. He's in a far country. He joins himself to citizens of the country. And now a famine comes, and he has spent all that he had doing all the fun stuff he wanted to do. He spent it all on what the Bible calls riotous living. He's probably, you know, out at the clubs, as it were, in our day, and, 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 and making it rain, and giving out all kinds of dollars, and buying perhaps the highest amounts of alcoholic beverages and probably has VIP space at the, at the, at the particular venues. And I know I probably don't have a terminology right because I'm not necessarily an expert in that field, but that being said, most of you get the point that he was living large. Probably had all of the best of everything. Probably had wonderful clothing to match. All those sorts of things. And probably had a whole lot of friends surrounding him now that he had become um, both rich and probably quite popular. All of a sudden, the last life would have it. Now there's a famine that now has caused um, the, 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 his status to now be not as wonderful as it was before. And now he's gone from, instead of going from rags to riches, he's now gone from riches to rags. 
And I don't know what that does to his self-esteem. I don't know what it does. When people start off without a whole lot, and then they get more, and then they lose it, that's a little bit different than always having it, and then losing it. And this young man apparently had always had, and now he's lost. I don't know what that does to his self-concept. I don't know what that does to his idea of who he is, or perhaps maybe we do know as we look at this text, and now he begins to compare himself with his father's hired servants. He says, if only I was at home, even if I weren't a son, if I was just a hired servant, I'd be doing better than I am now. And the conditions of his life and the extent to which his life has deteriorated now calls him to become introspective and finally realize, you know what? I think I might have made a mistake. I think I may have done something wrong. In fact, I might have been looking at this whole thing wrong. Oftentimes when we're doing well in the house, it's hard for us to see that clearly. Because again, I would submit to you that that mindset did not begin when he left the house. Before he left the house, he already had that messed up mindset. His ways were already messed up before he ever left. But it did not become readily apparent to him until later. At some point, you've got to recognize that I've been going about this thing all wrong. That I am terribly off. That the decisions that I make, the way that I'm, the things that I'm using to weigh my decisions, the criteria that I'm using, the values that are leading me to my decisions, all of it is wrong. I didn't just make one wrong choice. My whole way of thinking has been wrong. If I were to go back and re-examine my steps as the young man, the first thing is, how did I disrespect my father like that? How did I not properly value human relationships? How did I come to the point where I would squander and waste what my father perhaps worked so hard to, 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 to gather. How did I come to go to this faraway country and, and to live a life that probably would have caused my father to be ashamed? How did I do all that? What made me do all of that stuff? What were, when did I lose my values? When did I lose my way? When did I lose my proper path? When did I lose my proper footing? It's all wrong. It's all wrong. Wrong. The reason why we must totally surrender to God is because we totally mess up. If I were to preach to you repentance and help you to understand what repentance means in the New Testament context, when we come to God and we surrender our lives to God, we don't simply say to God, yeah, God, there are about three things I messed up on. I got 97% on the test, and I got three items out of 100 wrong. Lord, forgive me for the three items. No, the problem is that if you're truly honest with yourself, when you come to the altar of repentance, it is not that you simply got three items wrong. No, the whole assignment is wrong. All of it's wrong. All of it's messed up. There's no good in it at all. It's all Failure. It is absolute and abject failure. The whole thing is wrong. There is no redeeming quality about it. I think that one of the things that we struggle with in our 21st century mindset with respect to sin is that we are still convinced that in us there is some good thing that is redeemable and worth, you know, like, I'm not that bad. But the text says that even our righteousness is as filthy rags. That in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. And even when Paul starts to get an understanding of what he should be doing, he said, you know, the things that I would do, those things I do not, there's something wrong, categorically wrong, on the inside of me. And so I repent not just for what I've done, but I repent for who I am. Who have I turned out to be? Don't even recognize this guy anymore. Who is this guy? Who is this guy? His location with the swine is only indicative of how far.
are you as fallen as an individual? We look at the conditions and the context, etc., but you don't understand there's something deeper going on in the life of this young man. Before he ever got to the pig pen, there was something already unclean in him. It's not that what he did made him unclean. It was the fact that he was unclean that made him do what he did. And that's why when we come to God, we ask God to create in us a clean heart and to renew a right spirit within us because the difficulty is not just the stuff that I've done, but it's the stuff that's inside me that drove me to do the stuff in the first place. And so Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes perhaps in the New Testament times took a lot of pleasure in cleaning out the outside, as it were, of the proverbial dish and making sure the outside of the cup was clean. But Jesus would oftentimes challenge them and say, what good is it if the outside of your cup is clean if the inside of the cup is still dirty? It's not what goes into a man that pollutes a man, but it's what comes out from inside the man. It is out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks from outside the heart is where all these evil things come from. The issue is not just your outside. The issue is not just in the demonstration of the activities and the things that you have done. It is the heart that's driving. It is the works of the flesh. It is the way that you are wired internally that's causing you to do all of these shameful things. And you can try to do better all you want to. Try to behave better all you want to. But except God gets to the heart of who you are, you will still be lost. And so I've got to repent not just for what I've done. What I've done is a symptom of who I am. And for too long in the church, we simply address symptoms and we've had people repent for symptoms and you know and, and we've told people oh no you know your heart's in a good place you just made some mistake no no my heart is desperately wicked got to tell the truth about who I am, about what I am. Because if I still have an a, 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 a artificially inflated sense of who I am, my worship, my worship and my repentance is not actually complete. I haven't totally given myself over to God because I haven't totally come to grips with how messed up I am. One of the saddest things in our condition today is that we now have situations where people believe that they're doing God a favor. Oh, yes, you know, I gave God some time. Oh, no, it's not that you're doing God a favor. It's that you need to thank God that he was merciful to you, that you have a life in the first place. Because if God operated simply on the virtue or on the basis of justice, None of us would even have made it to wake, wake up this morning because none of us deserve to even be alive. But God, who was rich in mercy, God, who demonstrated his grace towards us, enabled us to receive more than we were ever worthy of receiving. And so as I look at this young man and I look at his journey, his journey is one where God has given him the mercy, the grace, to be able to see himself clearly. The text says at some point that he actually comes to himself. You know what we need in this world? We need, we, I know we talk a lot about, you know, um, people just don't feel good about this. No, what we need is a lot more honesty. People need to be, begin to see the truth with respect to who we are. And this is not simply in terms of who you are, but who we are. And to recognize how broken we are without him. See, when you recognize how broken you are without him, you can't ever look down your nose on anybody else because you know that except for the grace of God, you don't know what you be doing. Makes sense to anybody. When you see the problem is, it, it's not that we don't have enough self-esteem to come to church. The problem is sometimes we've got too much pride in the church, and our pride is actually um, demonstrating itself in terms of how we are able to then compare ourselves with one another. Who does this? No, when you recognize that all of us are flesh and all of us are nothing, then there's a profound sense of humility that overtakes us. And when God asks us for something, we don't struggle as much to do it because we recognize how little we are without him. And so we talk about total surrender. We talk about um, giving to God. 
And I hope you don't think that I mean just to suspect this money. I'm talking about the giving of who you are to God. And the reason why we sometimes struggle with giving is because we said before, if I give it all, what will I have left? What about me? And here is your issue. And here's what underlies it all. You are under the mistaken notion that what you have left is worth anything anyway. Who told you that this was worth anything? Who told you that this was worth Oh, I know. You told yourself that, oh, it was all that. It's all, it's, it's, yeah, I have all. It's my life. I do what. Uh, who told you that your life was worth so but yes, your life can be worth a whole lot with God in it. But without God in your life, who told you your life was worth so much? Let me remind you what the Bible says with respect to your life. The Bible says your life is a vapor. It's here today. It's gone tomorrow. You spend all this time trying to live your best life, and your life ain't going to work now. With respect to eternity, it is less than a flash in the pan. With respect to eternity, it's less than a millisecond in duration. With respect to eternity, it often, to a certain extent, you ask, what even is the significance? In fact, the psalmist says, what is man that thou art mindful of him? My worth and my value come to, uh, uh, exclusively from the fact that that it's him that has made me, that I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. But that's a credit to the creator, and it's not a credit to me. And so if that be the case, how can I dare hold back anything from him who gave me everything? What do I have that I did not first receive from him? What shall I render to God for all of his benefit? What, what, what? But what can I give to him? Because in essence, anything that I give to him is what he already gave to me. If I offer him praise with my breath, is not the breath from him who gave it to me in the first place? If I clap my hands, I've got to ask myself, well, who gave me the hands? If I begin to dance and shout, well, who gave me the feet. If I begin to pray, who gave me the tongue, the articulation of speech? Everything that I give to him, he gave to me first. If I give him an offer, who gave me the financial resource who provided for me in the first place? It's possible for me to give God anything in truth that he did not first give to me. So then I end up with a new problem that when I don't give God everything, I'm not really giving God anything because it reveals more about my mindset than it does anything else. When I refuse to give God everything, it says to God that I think I have something when in actuality I really don't. It took a while, but this young man finally realized that he really didn't have much of anything. He had nothing that could not be lost in a moment. All he has is his relationship with his God. Can I submit to you that all that you have that is worth anything in this life is your relationship with God? That with everything else, you boil it down to the least common thing. You boil it down to essence of what, what really matters, what really is left in life. Now, I know some of us thought that, you know, money counted for something. You thought maybe $100 was something. Or maybe $20 was something. And back in the day, Sister Angelica, I would tell you that $20 was something because I could go to the gas station and say, put $20 on one. And it moved the needle a lot. Might have been filled up the tank. And now my same $20, I take it to the gas station, 
And it might get me a good four gallons, maybe, of gas. Same money, different value. Now, I didn't vote for my value of my dollar to go down. I didn't vote for that. Nobody asked me, did they want my dollar to be less, worth less? Nobody asked me. They did not consider me. In fact, I went to sleep one night, woke up the next, and my dollar was worth less. It happened without my consent, happened without my input, happened without my control. Once upon a time, I could go to school, and I often share this for about $18,000, if that price, $16,000 or so. I could actually go to college, including room and board, and now, not like that anymore. The value of my dollar has decreased. And so if you think that money is what gives you any sort of sense of worth, I want to let you know that even your money depreciates sometimes over time. And so you can't even deal with that as a constant. And so what is it? that gives your life significance. You might say, well, it's the friends that I have. That's cute. That's nice. But sometimes friends are here today and gone tomorrow. You don't know why. Can't explain what can happen to them, but it just is what it is. As you can't build your life, perhaps, even on that. What, what else can you build your life upon? All you can do is that build your life upon Christ, the solid rock. He's the one that you can build your life on. And if you build your life on any else or anyone else, trust me, you will be disappointed. Because nothing else, nothing else but God and his word, but God and his word can be depended upon and relied upon. And so young man has to now go back and he has to go back and he has to repent and he has to get things back in order. And I want to submit to you that I know there's a whole lot of craziness going on in society. A whole lot of craziness going on in your world today. And everybody has their own version of what a solution is to the problems and the enigmas that we face in our daily experiences. But I want to submit to you that I don't care how many politicians say it, how many billionaires say it, whatever they might say, whatever they might think, that ultimately until we get our relationship back in order with the Father, Everything is just going to continue falling to shambles. There is no plan B. You don't get to make up for it by spending more money. You don't get to make up for it by printing more money. You don't get to make up for it by all of these countermeasures that we try to imagine that will solve the issues of our day. Because ultimately, the issue is not the problem of our actions. Ultimately, the issue is the problem of our hearts. And until people get their hearts right with God, you can enact all the legislation that you want to with respect to um, criminalizing behaviors and activities, etc. At some point, people's hearts are still going to show. People will still do things that are simply unexplainable and unimaginable. It takes the intervention of God. It takes us coming back to God. It takes us giving God a total Surrender. When the young man comes back, notice he's no longer in a bargaining position. He does not come back and say, Father, well, you know, he was making demands when he left. But when he comes back, now he's begging. It's amazing how, how, how things change just that fast. You know, and, and when we come to God as, as, as believers, so we come to him, um, it, it, the, 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 the dynamics are such that as we come to him, as we come to know about the Lord, etc., we've got to come humbly before him. The text says, if my people which are called by my name would humble themselves and pray. And oftentimes I see a lot of praying sometimes going on, but perhaps what we're missing is the humility. Perhaps what we're missing is the recognition of who God is and how far we have fallen. Humble yourself and pray and seek my face and turn from your wicked ways. When we refuse to humble ourselves, we, we see no reason to turn from our wicked ways because we think we're good. It does not simply say um, turn from your actions, it says turn from their wicked ways. There are ways. There's ways that we do things, ways that we approach. Our, we've got to turn from our ways. 
one of the benefits of training is that um, not only do you find out what you have to do from your job description, but eventually, back in the old days when they actually trained people, they would teach you how to do it. And you find out that each person perhaps might have had a different way of doing it. And some people had ways that were better than others. And the person that knew how to do it the best way would sometimes show somebody that did it the slowest and most inefficient way. But because the person had always done it that way, they didn't want to learn a new way to do it. And so they stuck with their habits, even though their habits were inefficient, and they were unwilling to change their ways. And as a society, there's been a whole lot of habits that have been formed and a whole lot of ways that people do things, but people don't want to hear God and hear his ways because they're used to doing things their own. Everybody wants to have their own way. Nobody wants to give up their ways. They like doing things their way. In fact, they might even do the, the thing you ask them, as you let them do it their way. But the problem is that God not only wants you to change what you're doing, but he wants you to change the way that you do it. And that's when we start getting answers. Because God says, no, no, I see what you're doing, but no, don't do it that way any more. And so God comes to you, comes to you this day, looking for a total surrender. You know, some of us, when you get a new boss at your job, like, I'll do it, but they're not going to tell me how to do it. You know, when you get your ass, like, I'll do it, but you know, you know, so, you know, you're supposed to, like, do X, Y, and Z. I'll do Z, Y, and X, but they won't tell me. That, and that little bit of control that you have makes you feel a little good about something, especially when you don't like them. But it's like, you know, you're, I can't, they, they, they can make me do some stuff, but the one thing they can't control is the way that I do it. I'll do it, but I won't be happy about it. Sometimes our ways is the last bit of control that we have in the situation that we're least likely to want to give up. And here you were coming to church, and God says, yep, here I am, coming for your ways. Coming for your ways. We thought Angela could talk a little bit this morning about ways. I don't know if you heard her. She said that um, she was considering or giving thought to prayer. She said, yeah, Lord, I, I pray. Prayer is good. And if you want to wake me up, I guess I'm okay with that. And God's like, let's try this out and see. And so then God shifts the way that she prays, what's acceptable. And so, you know, the casual prayer, perhaps that might have been at a convenient time, you know, that's the way she used to pray. God's like, we're going to do it a different way. And now she has to adjust, not the prayer, not the issue, it's the way now. Sister Angelica wasn't aware of this, but every morning in my house, there's been an alarm that's been going off at 5 a.m. 5 a.m. So from 5 a.m. until about 6 a.m., a little bit after it's been on long winded, I find myself, just like you, Sister Angelica, in prayer. Because God is coming after our ways. Think of that. You don't get to offer God to start the way that you want to of yourself. You know, I, I, I work remotely, and so it seems for me that as long as I carve out some time for God, he should be happy. Right? We talk when we talk. Right? But there's something to be said when you actually um, do it his way, and you begin to say, you know what? I, I, I really don't want to have to get up early to do this, but since all of the time belongs to God, since it all belongs to him anyway, I'm not only going to give God time, but I'm going to give God the time that he wants, as opposed to giving God the leftovers that I want him to have. You know, it's, really funny. it's all psychological in this example, but you'll get it when I say it to you. It is one thing to get um, a, a, a cheese thing, you know, Y'all don't usually eat cheese sticks with like forks and knives that often. You usually bite your cheese sticks. They go, ah, and you eat your cheese stick. You eat your cheese stick. 
It's one thing for me to, and let's say I have cheese and I have about a tolerance for you, like, let's say I can eat half a cheese stick. So half a mac is cheese stick. I'm kidding. Half, eat half a cheese stick. And, I, I, and, and, and this is what I can do. I can say to my friend, here, I have some cheese steak. Let me do this. I'm going to eat the part that I want. <laughs> and then I'm going to give you whatever I don't eat. You can have that. Right? And let's say I saved him half. That was a legitimate half. Or before I start eating, I can cut it in half and say, here, this is yours. I'm giving this to you. In both instances, I gave half. But in the first instance, I gave what was left over. In the second instance, I gave preferential treatment. God's not sitting here arguing about the cheesesteak. He knows you gave him half. But was it left over? That's the question. That's the question. That we say we value God, that we love God, that we honor God, we do all that great stuff, and I get it, because it's a sacrifice. I mean, you could have saved that cheesesteak for later and ate it tomorrow. But ultimately, what you gave him was your leftovers. That's why he starts coming for us in prayer, Sister Angelica, because we tell him that. Yes, but all the time belongs to you. You are God. You are God. And then we give him our, well, God, I got you this, I got this, and Lord, whatever's left over, I got you. We eat all the cheesesteak we want, and then we give him the leftover. And sometimes he only gets this much cheesecake, sometimes this amount. But God, you understand, you know, it was a late day. I was tired, had a lot of work to do, you know. And so God, I'm sorry, there's only two minutes left in this day, but you can have it. These two minutes are all yours. After all, it's not the quantity, it's the quality. Right? It's the quality. You know, you don't gotta pray for 10 hours, right? That's, it don't matter. But it does matter whether it's leftovers or not. It does matter whether it's priority or not. And again, you will not be able to find this on a, you can't go and measure this out and be like, oh yeah, you know, because you might look at one person and they gave an hour person, let's give an hour person, right? See, look, that's great. It's like, no, no, but she don't want it, but for one person it was their leftovers, somebody else was their priority. It's like giving a hundred dollars in church for somebody. They took that hundred dollars, but they didn't need that. It's like, Lord, I'm going to give this to you. Somebody else had a thousand. Said, Lord, whatever's left on this thousand, you can have. Well, God, I finish whatever I want here. Here's some dollars you can have right now. It's about the way that you. Sometimes it's not what you say. It's how you say it. Sometimes it's not what you give. It's how you give it. Oh, ways matter to you. Ways matter to you. If I come and I have a thousand dollars, right, and I say, "Here, Sister Angelica, God bless you. You've been wonderful, blessing to the ministry, etc." Here's this, you know, like that feels good. That feels nice. We outside for a whole bunch, bunch of people. I say, "Angelica, here, pick that." You're like, first of all, I'm gonna pick that up because I'm insulted. I don't care how much money it is. I don't know who you think you are. You're gonna throw something at me? I'm gonna take it. Please. You the way. And we've got to be very, very mindful of the way that we treat God. Okay. The praise was great. The prayer was great. The Bible study time was great. But was it something that you did with care and intentionality? Or did you just throw him the leftovers? Make sense? Anybody? He's coming for your. And so he says, if my people, if they call for my name, would humble themselves and pray and seek my faith and turn from there. That's just way to know it was wicked. It's a wicked way. He says, you've got to get rid of the wicked ways. And it's hard to preach about ways because nobody wants to give up their ways. There's just a way about us, and we don't like to give up our ways that we do things. We don't like to give up our ways. Love everybody. I'll love them, but hmm. 
That's your way right there. I see it. That's your way. It's right there. And God says you've got to give up those wicked ways. God is coming for your ways. Total surrender. Because you know we're holding this book. There's some stuff we just ain't going to do. Because we love God. But the way we do it, that's up for discussion. But today we remember that word, that word total surrender. You go to the video, it's like, oh, what more stuff does God want? This is going to be easy. A couple more things to knock off the checklist. Right, no, no, not checklist this time. It's ways this time. The way. So you might have to go back and look at all the things that you do for God and go back and re-examine the way that you do. says in the text, consider your ways. Go back and consider your consider your mode of operation. Consider how you do this now. She said, I know we, we, we do praise and worship and we worship God and we lift up. Consider how you do it. Consider it now. Consider it. Do we do it half party with our whole heart? Consider how you do it. Consider how you make offering to God. Consider how you praise him. Consider yeah, how you do it. Lord, I'm going to say thank you ten times. You got ten times, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Well, that's enough of that. I'm tired. Yeah. Consider your ways. Make consideration of it. I'm going to pray, Lord, in my personal time. If I ain't feeling that for the first three minutes, I'm done. Consider your ways. Give consideration to it because it's important. Because here's the thing. If you don't consider your ways and fix your ways eventually, they will find their way into your behaviors. If you don't prioritize God in your time eventually, if you don't prioritize God with that cheese stick, let's go with that, that analogy, eventually your appetite will increase and you'll eat the whole cheese steak and all you got left is the oops. Well, Lord, I had intended to give you some cheese steak, but I started eating it, and it just started tasting gooder and gooder. You know how that is. So, you know, you're, save me some. Okay, I'll save you some. But if you're not intentional about the save, that whole thing be gone. Especially if it's your favorite stuff. Don't ask me to save you some sweet potato pie. Might not happen. Unless I intentionally cut you head and then tell you to go take it home, it might not survive. Right? Because this is how it works out. You know, we start out like, hmm, this is good. Come on, something nice little piece. Yeah, yeah. Then let's you know it's gone. All right, that's another little sliver. Another little sliver. And that's you know, this all that's left of the whole thing. It's like, hmm, that ain't working. I'm going to eat it now. <laughs> And if you don't prioritize God and the things of God, you'll find yourself like, I'm going to take a little, little sliver. If you don't believe that, set aside time to pray sometime and you don't prioritize God. Oh, no. I can do it. Give me five more minutes. I'll do it in five more minutes. Yeah. Oh, that was 20 minutes that went past already. Oh, my gosh. All right, I need three more minutes. And the next thing you know, your whole day going. Now you're about to go to bed. So from now I lay me down to sleep snoring. Didn't even finish your prayer. And you think the problem, Lord, don't pray for me, saints, because the devil's trying to attack my prayer time. No, you gave God leftovers. Pray for me, saints. There's my trying to save God from cheese thing. It just keeps disappearing. No, no. The problem is the way that you're doing it. Pray for me, saints. There's my trying to pay my tithes. All my money runs out. No, you were trying to give God your leftovers. That makes sense. If I had a subtopic for this, we call it no more leftovers. No more leftovers. No more leftovers. Consider your ways. Consider your ways. No more. Does this message make sense for everybody? 
It makes sense for the Bible. I want to pray. It's time for us to pray. Anybody feel like repenting now? Like, oh, Lord. Now you want a cheesesteak? <laughs> Because oftentimes there's been so much of, you know why I give people leftovers? Because it's about my convenience, it's about my priority. Giving people leftovers lets me prioritize myself first and put them second. The way it should be. Except when you're dealing with God. Then you realize, oh, I know you can probably about to prefer one another above, prefer others above yourself. We won't cover that in today's message. But that's in the text here. But in these moments, Perhaps it's good for us to pause and to talk to God and be honest with him about how often we've given him leftovers. I tried to give you some, some examples to help paint the picture for you, but in order for this to be legitimate and authentic, you've got to take the time to examine your own hearts. You've got to think through your own life experiences, your own things that you've been doing, and find those areas where you have not totally surrendered to God. And ask God, first of all, to forgive us for not doing that. And then, and, and every time you think about leftover cheese steak, it's going to like make you chuckle. You're like, oh my goodness, I was doing that too. I really was doing that. I was. I was doing that. Mm, that's terrible, God. That's terrible. And I want you to take that that's terrible, God, and I want you to transition that into repentance. And I want you to, to, to ask God to change your heart because you recognize what that's saying. You are, I've been insulting God all this time. I thought I was doing good by giving God cheese steak. I thought I was. But I found out I was just giving him leftovers. It was an insult. That makes sense to anybody. And I don't want to insult God by giving God my leftovers anymore. I want to prioritize God. If I get around to that, then no, no. I need to prioritize God in a new way. We're about to pray. Your mouths are open. You're first thanking God for his mercy, for not cutting you off with those disrespectful leftovers. <laughs> Father, we thank you. Father, we give you glory. We appreciate you, God, for your mercy and for your kindness towards us. We thank you, Lord, that you have been so patient to us, so loving, so considerate of us, even we have not always mirrored the same to you. We pray, Father, in these moments that you would forgive us, God, for every time we did not make you a priority, for every time, God, we went about our lives, God, and we said, give us what belongs to us, and we did what we wanted to do. Father, forgive us, God, because we now see, God, that not only do we need to do the right things, but, God, we need to do the right things the right way. Father, in Jesus' name, by the grace of your Spirit, Lord, work in us to do of your good pleasure in the name of Jesus. Father, change our hearts. Transform us. Do something deep on the inside of us. We don't want to remain the same. We want to be forever changed by your power in the name of Jesus. Father, as we repent, God, we pray, Lord, that our hearts, oh God, would be inclined towards you. We pray, God, that you would help us, oh God, to embrace and to receive your truth and not to try to change, oh God, things to fit us and to fit what we want to do, but God, help us, oh God, to be willing to change, to accommodate your desires, to accommodate your plans in Jesus' name. And so, Father, we honor you in this moment. We honor you, God, in this time of reflection, this time, oh God, of, of sacred remembrance, as we remember, God, things that we have done that could be improved upon, God. We ask, God, for your mercy. We thank you, Lord. For the, for the blood of God that was shed for us. And God, we recognize the gravity of sin because we realize, God, that your blood was not shed just because you loved us. Your blood was shed because our sin demanded it. It was our sin that caused, oh God, that blood to have to flow. It was our sin that caused, oh God, the, all of the, the, the suffering and the shame that you had to endure. It wasn't just your love, God. No, no, it was our sins, God. Our sins had to be paid for. And so thank you so much for paying the price for our sins. But God, never let us treat sin casually again. 
impress upon us, oh God, the importance and the gravity, oh God, and the price that had to be paid, oh God, for our transgressions. And then God calls it to give us pause so that we'll seek to operate, oh God, with integrity and with love, and that we'll seek to, to obey your commandments and to live lives that please you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Somebody that loves God, can you give God praise in this moment? Amen. to go home at this point. There's nothing else late. I think we're just about done. Um, we do have we do have watermelon downstairs. We went to Shady Maple yesterday. They had these huge watermelons, so we had we bought stuff so we could um, do that. So we have that. And then secondly, also we picked up some apples while we were out. And so y'all can we got a bushel of apples and you can take some of those as well. Amen. Just you want to say so. Oh no. Okay. So Okay, all right. Anybody else have anything? We good? All right. Let's prepare to be dismissed. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness and for your kindness. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy. Now, Lord, let the words of our mouths, the meditations of our heart, be acceptable in your sight. O oh, Lord, to our strength and our super redeemer. People of God say, Amen. 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 Watermelon apple.